Reform or Revolt by Eric Schechter Part 1. Introduction War, poverty, ecocide, and other atrocities are all unnecessary, all worse than depicted in the news, all fabricated with bipartisan lies to make a few rich men richer. These atrocities kill millions of us and oppress billions. We will all be killed by ecosystem collapse or nuclear war if present trends continue a bit longer. We need big changes in a big hurry. But what kind of changes, and how? Reform or something more radical? Reformists believe that our democracy is adequate, or at least they believe that no better system will be possible in the near future and so they work within the existing system to gradually improve the world however they can. Radicals have other views. Here is one radical view. Our democracy is plutocracy in disguise. It is incapable of making the immense changes we need. The need is urgent, for we are on the verge of human extinction. There is no time left for gradualism. We must find some way to change the system, and soon. Initially, we don't have to choose between reform and revolt, for they begin the same way. A growing awareness leads to a movement, holding meetings, making signs, marching in the streets, handing out leaflets, listing demands, recruiting more people. Recruitment succeeds if the message is one that people are ready for. But ultimately, our message must include a discussion of our long-term vision and goals, for those shape our short-term efforts. And so this video discusses how and why our socioeconomic system has gone so horribly wrong. Part 2. Different Perceptions How is it that the reformist and radical see the world so differently? Well, we have different trusted news sources. Trust, like friendship, cannot be won through debate. Reformists follow mainstream, seemingly authoritative, radio, television, and newspapers. Those are the corporate news media. They are owned by the same plutocrats who own the banks, insurance companies, weapons companies, etc. Plutocrats twist the news to serve their own interests. Part of that twisting consists of conscious, intentional lies, but much more of it is simply perpetuating myths that the plutocrats themselves believe. For instance, that the rich are wise and deserve their wealth and influence. The deception of the public is aided by the public's short memory. Some economic or military policy may turn out to be entirely wrong, but the corporate press doesn't dwell on that fact and that policy supporters continue to act as experts. Radicals, on the other hand, have a wider variety of news sources. We choose our sources carefully, based on what we've seen, read, and thought. Part 3. Plutocracy Regardless of election results, the rich get the public policies they want, and the rest of us don't. Thus we have plutocracy rule by the rich. That reality has long been widely believed, but it was proved statistically in 2014 by Professors Gillins and Page. Plutocracy is also called oligarchy, which means rule by the few. That's the same thing, because the rich are few. The rulers figure that we won't rebel if we don't see our chains, so our plutocracy is disguised as democracy. However, a real democracy would be only a slight improvement. After all, we can't vote wisely while misled by lies of the corporate news media. We need news media that are not privately owned. Moreover, 51% riding roughshod over 49% is not a prescription for harmony. What we really need is a culture of caring, understanding, and consensus that leaves no one behind. Part 4. Corruption Power corrupts, as we see in domestic violence, workplace bullying, police brutality, prison torture, 
military atrocities, and the many crimes of politicians and corporate executives. Let's look at corruption in government. Our mythology tells of a barrier between government and business, preventing our elected officials from personally profiting from their positions. That myth is false. Actually, there is a revolving door between government and business. Our top politicians are rich, and they or their spouses have big investments in the very corporations they're supposed to be regulating. Their election campaigns are funded by the corporations. They appoint corporate executives to high positions, award big government contracts to their friends, and later retire to jobs as lobbyists for the companies they've befriended. Our mythology also says that our politicians are kind humanitarians, serving the common good of the people, debating among themselves only about how that is best done. This myth is entirely BS. Actually, our politicians and corporate executives are mass murderers, for their lies generate war, poverty, and ecocide. But that shouldn't be surprising. Our society is organized in competitive hierarchies, a natural breeding ground for sociopaths. Part 5. The Evils of Competition The plutocrats compete against each other. Indeed, if they were united in conspiracy, they would say to one another, Come, let us take steps to save the ecosystem, on which even we gods are dependent. Indeed, corporations currently are rushing to look environmentally conscious. But that's all just greenwashing. After all, the laws of the market haven't changed. To survive competition, corporations still must put short-term profit ahead of all else. Consequently, their externalized costs are destroying the ecosystem. That shows the plutocrats are not united. If the benefits of increasing automation were shared, we could all have more leisure time and higher pay. But instead, automation means layoffs, because the 1% owns all the machines. We, the 99%, must compete against each other for the few remaining jobs, just to survive. And so our workplaces are dictatorships, and we are commodities to be exploited or discarded. That's why we hate Mondays. The sickness is in our culture, in all of us, not just our rulers. Despite the threats facing all of us together, separate property gives us the illusion of separate lives, and our competition for survival kills empathy. That leaves fear, greed, hate, lies, bullying, madness, random shootings. The mass shooters are friendless so our separateness makes us victims of each other. Our separateness also makes it hard for us to rebel against the plutocrats. Part 6. How did things go wrong? The concentration of wealth results in plutocracy and all its corruption. But how did wealth become so concentrated? That phenomenon has been too consistent and has become too big to be attributed to a fluke or a few thefts. It must be something very fundamental in our economic system. Here is one simple explanation. If we don't share, we must trade. For labor, food, rent, interest, influence, for everything. Trade brings profit to both traders, because the commodity being sold is worth more to the buyer than the seller. Otherwise, the trade wouldn't happen. But trade increases inequality by giving greater profit to whichever trader was already in the stronger bargaining position. Part 7. When did things go wrong? The data of Gillens and Page go back only a few decades, but the USA has been a plutocracy calling itself democracy ever since its founding in land theft, genocide, slavery, and indentured servitude. Indeed, plutocracy and war and poverty are much older than the USA. They are as old as the greed of ancient kings. But the threat of nuclear or climate apocalypse is more recent. It is that same ancient greed, but magnified by modern science and technology. Part 8. 
What kind of change do we need? Some people associate the word revolution with violence. Perhaps awakening is a better word for what we need. It's all about spreading ideas. Our rulers suppress dissent violently, but our response should be as nonviolent as possible. Violence may alienate the very people we are trying to awaken and recruit, people who are only beginning to understand what is really going on. It's not enough to throw out the plutocrats. If we do that without changing our culture, that culture will quickly spawn a new batch of plutocrats, as happened in 1776. Modern science and technology have magnified ancient cultural problems, bringing us to the brink of extinction. It's our biggest threat in millions of years. To survive, we need to awaken to a very different culture, our biggest change in thousands of years. We need everyone to see what has been right in front of us all along, though it will look unfamiliar. We've been tormented by plutocrats since the invention of private property 12,000 years ago, but for 200,000 years before that, we cared and shared as equals. Genetically, that's still who we are. That's still what we teach our kids, still where we turn in times of crisis. Let's replace hierarchy with horizontalism and property with sharing. That's the only way we'll end war, poverty, and ecocide. That's the only way we'll survive. In fact, it's more than just survival. Our reunion will be joyous. Join the conversation. Help spread the word. A transcript, leaflet, and related links for this video can be found at leftymathprof.wordpress.com slash ROR.